going everyone? Dan here. We're going to cover Base Station 2. This was my first analog mono synth. The first analog synth I bought was a Korg Minilog and I did not like it. I know that's like, oh wow, a lot of people really love those, but to me it had some issues and so I sold it and I bought this and I haven't regretted it. It's actually kept up with the times and kept up with my rig and my needs. Uh, that was many years ago now and I still really love it. I'm never going to sell this thing. So we're going to go over some of the cool features on it. Uh, some of the things that make it really both a classic sound as well as a very modern instrument. They had some very strong foresight when they designed it at Novation, at Novation which allowed them to really create an instrument that's going to stand the test of time. And in fact, it's still, if not more up to date, as up to date as other instruments that are coming out today. Uh, the second thing about it is they put an update out in 2019 that added a number of key features like oscillator drift during pitch bend. Uh, and you can adjust the parameters on that as well as it added the Aphex mode, which is totally awesome. We're going to go into that near the end of the video. So these are my thoughts on why it's still relevant. This is how you can use it, showing you some of the straight up tips on how to get the most out of it, how to access Aphex mode and do something really cool with it. So enjoy. Let me know in the comments what you think. If you like the video, please subscribe. Thanks, everyone. Hey, everyone. So we're going to go over base station 2 now. It's a really great synth and it's older. So there's a number of things about the base station 2 that it still does better than a lot of other synths. And in 2019 they released a revision on it, the Aphex station. Uh, but the OG base station 2 got the firmware update. So aside from the branding, the silk screen on it, they're actually feature equal. So we're going to go over some of those things. But before we even get to those things, there's a lot of things that are just built in the base station 2 that were really smart that make it still super relevant today. Uh, so let's just talk about a few of those things real quickly. First things first, the way I have this plugged in makes this really unique for... Uh, current or even modern and future implementations within a larger rig. I'm powering and doing MIDI off of a USB cable. That's fantastic. It cuts out an extra cable. It makes it a lot easier to, to route things up. I have this being used with my Akai Force, and so the ability to use USB MIDI is fantastic, and being able to power it off the Akai Force's USB ports or off of a powered hub makes this really just dead simple to connect into a modern um, sequenced rig. That's the number one thing I'd say about this that's really cool. And later on, we're going to take a look at how it sequences within the Akai Force because it's really special. It's really interesting. And this thing came out in 2015, and they just had so many good ideas they put in here that make it still super relevant. But the first and foremost thing for any synth is how does it sound? And so we're going to actually listen to that real quickly. sounds good. Gnarly distorted bass tones. Let's take the bass off. All right, so right now I have both oscillators off, only the sub oscillator running, and this is thing number one that Base Station 2 does that a lot of other synths don't. The sub oscillator is a sine wave. There's other synths that have sine waves as their oscillator. Uh, for example, the Mini Brute 2S slams because its second oscillator can do a sine wave, but this is a sub oscillator. In the update to Aphex mode in 2019, it also is decoupled, so you can, if you choose, um, pitch it differently as opposed to having it just follow the MIDI that comes in, right? Just like you can do relative pitch between oscillators one and two. You may also hear on there, there's a little bit of noise. I think I probably need to turn that off. And then there's also a limiter on the base station too. And by putting the limiter in, you hit function limiter and it's on or it's off. So that actually takes the sine wave and compresses it a little bit, getting it closer to being something square. 
there's three other sub oscillators. So that's a pulse width modulation and a square wave. And you could do two octaves. That sounds awesome. I don't care what anyone says. It's it sounds like a, a, a sub you could get on a Moog, something you know that generally would have a, a lot of respect on it. I'm gonna turn off the effects on it just so you can hear all of them. Hear it uh, solo and the sub. If you have a subwoofer hooked up, this should be slamming right now. I'm turning these effects back on. I will pivot them back on and off as we go. Just a little bit of delay and a little bit of reverb, really. All right, so that's thing one. It sounds really good. It has a modern feature set, but it also has a classic feature set. Initialization is your standard sawtooth patch. You can pitch it around. And you can fine tune it. Meaning, detuned saws are really easy to do. Further, you can And you can also throw sync on. That is function, and then here we go. Function oscillator section sync. So essentially what you're doing there is you're phase locking the harmonics. It's a classic feature. All right, so as easy to implement jammable, dare I say, uh, classic subtractive synth features that sound very good. That's awesome. All right, thing number three. So th number one is the sub. All right, number one is the implementation of the MIDI. Number two is the sub oscillator here is the sub. Number three, classic features. Number four is the filter knob, the frequency. The cutoff frequency knob. So first off, the cutoff on here is uh, designed to sound like the Wasp filter. So if you know your synth history, Chris Huggett um, designed the Imposcar Wasps. He was a consultant until uh, he passed away recently for Novation. And so this is kind of a modern implementation of that. It has one modern feature that makes it really awesome. So one of the things that annoy a lot of people about um, encoder-based analog since is the knob can be very steppy because if you're encoder based which everything on here is so everything on here is automatable you can sometimes hear the steps but you can't with this it's smooth and the reason why is because it actually uses two MIDI CC's so uh, zero to halfway is on one, 
and then halfway up is on the next MIDI CC. So it's 256 different points, thus doubling the resolution. So there is steps, you just can't really hear them because it's uh, significantly higher than your ability to hear. Now that makes it really easy to record. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go into the clip and I'm going to record it. Uh -huh. I'm going to actually arm it to record this time. All right. Now we're going to go into the clip and record it. I'm going to get some video on my phone of this so you can see how it worked out. So I just got some video on my phone. I'll show that in the actual video once I stitch it all together. But basically, it recorded it onto two MIDI CCs, and it was seamless. It was easy. I did nothing to configure this aside from set the MIDI channel correctly on the high force. So thing number four, the cutoff is awesome sounding because it models the Wasp, and it has some very futuristic kind of thinking behind it to make sure that it still sounds good in modern systems particularly splitting the range up between two MIDI control change uh, values. Okay, so next up on here that makes it really cool. Thing number five, I guess. <laughs> We're going to go to six even though at the very beginning I said five. Um, all right, thing number five that I really love on here is that you can sync LFOs. That's easily done. So we're going to do LFO2 because I'm going to do it to the filter. So now it should be synced. See? It says synced, you're synced. Exit. I'm actually going to undo the automation that I did on the force because I want to have it happen here instead now. I'm going to set up a triangle wave. So what's doing now is it's doing time-based divisions. You can also change the delay on it to how long until it starts. This is good for creating vibrato-based effects. So the more staccato notes I have, are the LFO isn't even kicking in on now. It's kicking in based on what I set for delay on those two longer notes. Goes right up to sub -audible. That sounds awesome. 
All right, the next thing about here, about the base station two that's really fantastic is the arpeggiator. And to do this, I'm gonna record a different I'm just gonna hold this chord and record it. <laughs> We're gonna edit some of this out. Okay. Chord arm is on correctly. That's the chord I'm gonna outline with it. So. What the hell, lighting? Okay, so we have our chord recorded. We're gonna turn the arpeggiator on. Turn the arpeggiator on. Function hit latch so that it turns on, then hit latch. Or you can hit latch and do it like this if you want to do it on the keyboard, but you have to turn the arpeggiation on. Okay, so here's what's cool about it is you have 32 different rhythms that you can have up front and different arpeggiation um, options. Pretty standard suite. Up, down, up, down, one, up, down, two, which is like the Stranger Things one. Played, which is the order at which you play them in and random. We're gonna do up, down, two. We're gonna put it at three octaves and we're gonna set it to the highest rhythm amount. Let's see what happens. arpeggiation there. All right, some other things about this. Everything has aftertouch, every key at least. So if you are a player, it's a pretty fun keyboard to play. Routing aftertouch is, what the heck? It's gonna get a new light here in a second. Okay, routing aftertouch is pretty easy on here. You hit function and you can do the filter frequency or LFO one to oscillate or pitch. We're gonna do filter frequency. That's like depth, right? So if you're a player. Okay, and then to pitch, function, oscillator pitch, this is depth as well.
Not bad, right? All right, what else is really awesome about this? Uh, it has a limiter. Oh, I have to do at least an intro. I need to do at least an introduction to Aphex mode. Entering Aphex mode is not that hard. You hit function, swing twice. Then you're in Aphex mode. It comes with several presets, but you could do the presets yourself. I will do a full-blown tutorial on Aphex mode later. But for now, what we're going to do is we're actually going to just sequence something up. So. So we're lower my octave. Aphex mode. What it is is each key is a different preset. And so you can set them all by holding it down. And changing settings. This should have some resonance with uh, minimal techno people because it's really interesting. So you find sounds you like. Again with the lighting. This light is about to go bye-bye in my opinion. Do I need to get maybe this off? And this off? If it's not that, then I'm just replacing that light. The way you affect it now is you So as each one's sounding, you have the opportunity to tweak it, which means you can get some pretty interesting things by playing with one knob, really. This light is going to kill me. I mean, I'm not sure what else to say. That is a really cool, interesting feature that you don't find on many other synths, if any at all. I'm gonna turn the effects off so you can hear it dry. Sounds pretty good. 